Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, a checklist for investigating, understanding what went wrong in boat deaths and accidents. Before we begin our presentation today, I would like to take a few moments to go over some housekeeping items. We will be recording this webinar and this presentation is CLE approved and we will be asking you to enter a passcode for CLE credit a few times throughout the presentation. In today's webinar, Dr. Smith will provide the most recent information about current investigations of boating deaths and accidents. He will discuss the basic causes of boating accidents, where to find information about boating accidents from state, federal, and other sources, boating accident scenarios examined through aspects of engineering and materials, as well as expanded definitions of behavioral factors, as well as an examination of accident populations by time, place, age of participants, activities, areas, and type of vessels involved. To give you a little background about our presenter, Commander David Smith, he holds a PhD in education from St. Louis University and a BS in Naval Science from the U.S. Coast Guard. He has 33 years of experience in litigation cases that involve boat collisions, jet skis, drowning accidents, diving injuries in pools, cervical spine injuries on boats, and injuries from above and in ground pools as well as at beaches. Dr. Smith has also reviewed accidents involving diving from boats, pool beach design and construction, water skiing and tubing, whitewater rafting, as well as many other types of aquatic accidents. He has been retained or consulted in over 600 cases involving aquatic, boating, or Jones Act litigation. For those of our attendees who require a code word for tracking purposes, the code word for today is voting. During the presentation, we will take short breaks, and during that time, we will ask that you enter this code into the chat feature for CLE reporting purposes. The chat feature is located to the right of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself. If you have attempted to log on and received an error, or if you are listening via telephone, please email the passcode both times that is requested, and please state the time that you have entered your code in your email. Also, please remember to complete the survey that will appear on your screen at the end of the presentation. As a provider of CLE credits, we are required to have supportive information that you have attended, and in many states, the survey is required. Dr. Smith welcomes your questions. Please use the chat feature to submit your questions throughout the presentation. We will take intermittent breaks so that Dr. Smith can respond. Thank you all again for attending today. And David, the presentation is now turned over to you. Thank you, Nigel. Dave Smith here, and uh, a little uh, bit on my background. Um, but first of all, I must congratulate FASA on scheduling this webinar during National Safe Boating Week. So congratulations to you folks. Uh, assiduous scheduling. Uh, 25 years in the Coast Guard. At the time I retired, I was the Chief of Boating Safety of the 2nd Coast Guard District in St. Louis. Um, I have been uh, involved in, uh, as, as an expert witness for 33 years. Uh, I've had around 200 different types of boating-related cases. Uh, of this, uh, 10% have been to trial, and of course 50% have, have been involved in depositions. Um, what we're going to look at is the causation of boating accidents, boating fatalities, boating injuries uh, from three aspects. And that will be uh, from an engineering or material or physics type of aspect, regulations, laws, rules, and so forth. And then the third thing will be psychology. And uh, I should explain that my background, uh, graduate background, is essentially related to educational psychology. So you not only have to know things about what makes a boat go and what rules you have to follow while you're making that boat go, but also what might be going through the mind or the perceptions of the operator. And that's that's what we'll be looking at. We'll be dealing 
with uh, statistics um, initially to try to identify what causes um, voting accidents. Uh, you see in the middle of this slide NASBLA, National Association for State Voting Law Administrators. This relates back to the Federal Voting Safety Act of 1971 where essentially the Coast Guard was mandated by Congress to do something about the 15 to 1,600 deaths in voting every year. And uh, interesting programs were generated by the Coast Guard to deal with this. And I'm happy to say that according to uh, the latest Coast Guard figures, which are for the voting year of 2012, there were 651 voting fatalities which is the lowest um, on, on record since these programs were started. Uh, part of gathering this information comes from voting action reports, or BARs. And if you were going to gather information about a case, a voting case, you uh, should be very cognizant of the information which may or may not be uh, in the voting action report. So we'll spend some time talking about that. You can Google as law, and of course you can Google various Coast Guard uh, voting safety resources for statistics and uh, other information. You can also go to your state voting law administrator. Each state has to have a voting law administrator in order to receive federal funds, and each state does. But their office will have a great deal of information about information on, on statistics, uh, voting safety, and, and so forth. NASBLA also has a number of model acts, uh, voting safety acts. Uh, for instance, dealing with uh, personal watercraft, uh, voting liveries, or, or suggested rental regulations, um, operating while intoxicated. That's all available through uh, National Association of State Voting Law Administrators. We will probably get in, I'm going to try to stay away from esoterics as much as I can, but we may get into some um, questions that you may have about some of the, uh, the subtler things uh, in this presentation. Uh, for instance, the primary cause, again, of, of deaths in boating is drowning. And if we're going to investigate and understand how people die in boating accidents, we have to have some knowledge about drowning, so we'll be talking about that. Um, and uh, also, we're about to uh, uh, confirm your suspicions that at least half of the people involved in, in fatal boating accidents are under the influence of uh, um, ethanol. And so we will talk about ethanol. But um, a number of things that I'm going to bring up you may or may not be aware of, and also may have a reluctance to accept, um, and we'll, we'll move along that way. So uh, please uh, keep your antennae tuned, and if you hear something that really doesn't seem to make too much sense based on what you've been told, either about what happens to people in the water or ethanol, uh, ask a question about it. <clears throat> the uh, Coast Guard, as, as part of the Federal Boating Safety Act of 1971, must maintain a, uh, uh, a detailed accident reporting system. And as you'll see at the bottom of this slide, there is um, uh, where you can go to get these statistics. And actually, I, the present size, I believe, is 80 pages. Um, and it, it's very detailed. And uh, it gives you a general idea, as we'll see in a minute or so, of what constitutes uh, the population of uh, voting accidents and voting fatalities, and what the Coast Guard has uh, indicated are the primary um, causes. There's also information available from um, the Centers for Disease Control, we'll talk about that in a little bit, the National Safety Council, and other safety organizations. Now, the Coast Guard itself is divided into nine different districts. Uh, spread throughout the U.S., and actually, of course, they're in Hawaii, Alaska, and so forth. And you can also go to your local, well, not local, but your uh, regional Coast Guard district office has a 
um, a state boating safety liaison officer called a slow boat. And uh, they have information about different states, and, and uh, they also handling, handle the processing of, of these uh, boating accident reports. This is the uh, breakdown for the year 2012. And that's the most recent year of data in, in the Coast Guard file. Now, we'll just run through this real quickly. You can look at the, I believe you can see that, all right, uh, the top five primary accident types. Notice that uh, the flooding and swamping has the largest number of deaths, followed by um, collisions with a fixed object and then collisions with a recreational vehicle. David, I'm going to interrupt you really quick. Could you possibly speak up a little bit? I think it's um, it's going in and out a little bit, and it's a little bit hard to hear. Okay. Is this better? Yes, much better. Thank you. All right. Um, what we must understand is that um, the average boat involved in a fatal boating accident is uh, about 14 foot long, and it in most of these accidents, uh, it, it either does not have a motor or uh, it's got a motor of 10 horsepower or less. And again, what will cause the fatality? Well, someone will, will drown, either by falling overboard, capsizing the boat. The types, uh, the next category, uh, you can see uh, most of the, the uh, casualties are open motor boats. But uh, notice the PWC, personal watercraft. At one time, the personal watercraft represented 10% of the boating uh, boats registered in the U.S., but 25% of the fatalities. And, of course, we've all heard horror stories or actually been involved in litigation with personal watercraft um, uh, cases. But um, that's changed. As you can see, it, it, it's not as a huge a percentage as, as it has been in the past. And uh, there are a number of factors involved with that, and education has a lot to do with it. And the Coast Guard is involved in what's called a 3E approach to boating safety. That's engineering, education, and enforcement. And in engineering, uh, boats are, must be manufactured to certain standards, especially boats that are under uh, 20 feet long, sold or manufactured in the U.S. And we'll touch with that uh, in a minute. Uh, enforcement, uh, we're going to talk about rule, rules and, and regulations and laws pertaining to boats, especially rules of the road. And then we'll talk about uh, education, especially how the Coast Guard and the state. And the states are carrying a large part of the burden in this. At one time, the Coast Guard uh, was the pre premier uh, agency in the U.S. doing uh, this in boating. No longer so. It's, it's well spread throughout the state. Um, notice that uh, canoes and kayaks um, in this uh, second category um, have a lot of drownings, and we're going to talk about why. And again, these are non-powered craft, relatively close to shore, that aren't moving very fast. But there are dangers, and um, there are a number of syndromes, behavioral syndromes, the patterns of behavior that, that are, are prominent with these types of craft. Notice also, you don't see sailboats. And the reason is that uh, I believe um, anyone can operate a motorboat without, almost all, without a license. Of course, there are age restrictions. Um, but uh, vis-a-vis a car, you don't need in Maine a license. So in the Maine, a license. But a, a sailboat operator usually has much more experience and uh, know-how about boating, and they tend to be not only safer, but they move at much slower speeds. Notice that uh, life jacket wear, and you'll see that in the 80% of the fatalities, life jackets were not worn. Now, something about life jackets that can play a part in litigation. 
The federal law, as well as state law, again, in the main, uh, says that you must have the life jacket readily available. Now, of course, uh, in different states, and actually in federal law on federal waters, uh, children of certain ages, um, usually up to six, must wear a life jacket on a boat. But after that, you're not really, you don't really require to wear a life jacket, except if you're on a personal watercraft. Um, but they must be readily available. And that means that even though you will buy some brand new ones, you take them out of the bags. Because, believe it or not, unfortunately, there have been people who have died in the water because they, they couldn't get the life jacket out of the plastic bag that it came in. With life jackets also, we get into what I call the John Wayne syndrome, where um, I don't have to wear one because I'm invincible and I'm Mr. America. And, of course, that's affected by um, ethanol. And we'll talk about different types of life jackets. And uh, there are uh, myriad types. Um, we'll, we'll talk about hunters and fishermen. And you can have camouflage life jackets. Um, and they look just like hunting or, or fishing gear. And um, there's a growing awareness of this, but uh, it's, it's still needs to be spread around. The top ten for Dave Letterman down there at the bottom is, um, notice it's ethanol, uh, looms large, and um, hazardous waters. And, of course, that relates back again to kayaks and, and, and canoes and white water operations. Notice that the number of accidents have to do with operator inattention um, and experience lookout. And this thing about lookout is, is so important in a boat, especially the small high-speed motorboats or personal watercraft. You must know what's happening in front of you, as well as having a situational awareness about what's going on around you, and, and especially, again, with personal watercraft. Here's another uh, a couple of places you can go to get information about um, accidents. Um, Centers for Disease Control. And by the way, I should mention that um, fatal accidents for all causes in the United States have been reduced by about 25% over the last 30 years. Drowning, on the other hand, in, in 1980, we lost uh, in the U.S. and Canada a total of about 9,000 people a year to drowning. Uh, Last year, that was down to 4,000. So something's happening. And uh, to improve water safety, and thinking that half the population of the U.S. and Canada are exposed to the hazard uh, in, on, under, around the water. And uh, there are some acronyms that may be playing a role in this, and that's uh, CPR, EMS, AED, and PFD. But again, at the other end of the spectrum, you still have ETH for ethanol, which, which needs to be considered. Um, some of the cases you may be involved in, uh, was CPR performed, was performed appropriately and properly? Was, was EMS called? Um, were PFDs used properly? Were they present? These are all, all questions that need, need to be asked. There are other places to go for information, too. Um, many of you know about Chapman's piloting small boat uh, book, which is called the Bible, uh, small boating, recreational boating, and uh, much good information there. Google has uh, many uh, websites uh, dedicated to um, hit hints on and tips on, on boating safety. Um, there are also, you can Google uh, accident investigation manuals. Another place to get information about uh, boating safety and, and um, what's done to prevent against accidents is the National Marine Manufacturer Association. And as you say, it's bad, it's ENMA, but it's not really the ENMA. It's N-M-M-A, National Marine Manufacturing Association in Chicago. They have a number of publications on uh, how to operate different types of boats with many uh, safety uh, suggestions and tips. All, again, the, the states, or rather, uh, the states and the federal government have accident investigation courses. And that's the good news. The bad news is 
you have to be a person uh, actively involved in law enforcement to take one of these accident, uh, boating accident investigation courses. Um, perhaps your firm um, has uh, has retained an uh, actively law enforcement officer uh, to uh, consult with. If so, that person may be able to set in on one of these courses. Uh, they're 40 hours long, though. <clears throat> This is one of six, uh, two of six pages. If you go to the U.S. Coast Guard uh, Boating Safety uh, website, um, especially the uh, website that has the uh, boating accident uh, report for 2012 statistics, the last couple pages in that website uh, contains this sample form. Now, this is the Federal Coast Guard form. States vary. They're required to provide um, this information, but they do it in different ways. But this is uh, the one that the Fed, federal government puts out. And if you look on the upper left side, you may have to squint at this to see it, but there are the reasons for submitting these reports. And what they are is uh, if someone died in an accident, boating accident, if someone was injured beyond first aid, if um, someone disappeared and has not been yet recovered, um, if damage to the boat is $2,000 or more, or if uh, a boat was a write-off, a, a total loss. And each one of these blocks, there's many blocks here, and by the time you go through six different pages, there are many, many blocks. But in working up your case, uh, you want to pay specific attention to each one of these blocks. A, to make sure it's filled in properly or filled in at all. Now, the Coast Guard requires the boat operator in an accident to be responsible for submitting this. Um, and uh, you'll agree that's somewhat self-serving. But in many fatal accidents that are investigated by police and law enforcement, um, the law enforcement officials fill the forms out. Um, let me see. I'm looking over various things on those forms. Um, David, I do have a question regarding the form, and the question comes from Jeff, and he asks, are these bar forms available to the public with regard to any particular voting accident? Yes and no. Each state voting law administrator will provide you that state's voting accident report form. Now, whether they will actually uh, make available to you a redacted form that's been filled in for an accident, that's part of their policy, and you may have to go to Freedom of Information. I hope that answers the question. It does. And just as a reminder, we're coming up actually to the halfway, almost to the halfway mark of the presentation, so I just want to be cognizant of time as well. Um, I do have one other question here from Zach. He um, actually typed this in a little bit ago, and Zach asks, are there – an are there equivalent – I'm not reading this correctly. Are there any equivalent guest statutes in a boating arena similar to motor vehicle accidents, particular to private non-commercial owners? I didn't get the first part of that. Could you read it? Uh, equivalent? Really? Sure. Are there any, equi are there any equivalent guest statutes in a boating arena similar to motor vehicle accidents, particular to private non-commercial owners. And, and do you say guest? I, I got guest factors. Guest, as in oh. you're having company over. They are okay. your guests. Basically, uh, the captain of the boat is responsible for the safety of, of everyone on board. Now, there may be exceptions where someone just does some kind of behavior that uh, is unreasonable and unexpected. But by and large, that's federal and state law. The operator is responsible. I hope that answers the question. Okay, now we're on slide, uh, which has the uh, big three questions up there. Um, that fellow in the boat is going to go out in the morning, uh, that fellow in the, in the hunting boat, 
He's going to go out early in the morning in relatively cold water um, almost any time of the year. And he's probably not going to tell anybody where he's going, and he's not going to tell anybody when he's going to come, be coming back. And there's a good chance he will not be wearing a life jacket. And um, believe it or not, one of the primary causes of death in hunting is drowning. Uh, in one month in Michigan, um, in November, um, a number of years ago, there were 10 duck hunters died in, in boating accidents. So um, uh, this is part of, of the hunting and fishing um, um, business is to know about boating safety and to make sure that the, the, the operators are, in fact, following the proper, appropriate boating safety rules and regulations. Next picture you have a, a, a PwC pulling a tube, and notice that the uh, observer is sitting behind, behind the operator looking toward the tube. That's a, a requirement in most states. Some states say that you have to have rearview mirrors, but all, almost all of them say you need to have an observer. And uh, In fact, I'm working on a case right now where, that, where there was no um, uh, observer, and there was a terrible accident which ensued. The party time business. Um, as you can see, there's a good chance for somebody being uh, less than happy about the outcome of this, especially if there's, there's a lot of uh, drinking going on. Some states require that if you're going to nest with a large number of boats, you must, everyone must wear a life jacket, which isn't a bad idea. But just think what might happen if these folks are maneuvering, even at low speed, but have been imbibing. It can set up uh, an accident. That's uh, it's something that, that needs to be looked at. <clears throat> this slide relates to uh, some of the basic scenarios involved. Uh, children. Um, we will get a little later and talk a little bit about drowning, but the average drowning takes 60 seconds for an adult where a person struggles on the surface of the water. A child, um, four, five, six, years old, and they struggle for up to 40 seconds before they go on the water. So it is really uh, important that they are constantly observed and that they wear life jackets, uh, even if they may have um, um, swimming skills. It, it's very important that the child be protected at all times. Um, the thing about it, young adults here and thrill rides, uh, there's a lot of uh, psychological um, uh, studies and, um, that have come out recently indicating that the parts of the brain that have to do with uh, uh, self-gratification develop before the parts of the brain that develop about judgment. And um, you can have a 14-year-old youngster operating a multi-engine, high-power, high-speed um, boat uh, in a number of states. We may have a uh, taken a, a course and have a car to say. But nonetheless, that's uh, a person who may not be sufficiently advanced in judgment. And in fact, I've had cases where that, and, and where one of the cases, a 14-year-old um, ran over his boat, his best friend, uh, who was in a personal watercraft. So there, uh, some appreciation should be given to whether uh, you're going to allow younger people to operate these boats. Pontoon boats, um, they're big sails, and, um, and a lot of accidents occur because the boat is not anchored properly and starts drifting in the wind, and there are swimmers in the water with or without life jackets, and the boat is blown away from them. So in, uh, in pontoon boat cases, make sure that there is sufficient uh, um, anchoring gear aboard used properly, and that, in fact, the folks know how to use it and are practiced in it. This has to do with, um, as you can see, there's a boat on the beach, and that looks like uh, a perfectly safe scenario. It may or may not be. You're on the beach, you take off your life jacket, especially kids, and you start waiting. There's a hole there. If you're not paying attention to the child, and they step in the hole. And again, it doesn't take long. And by the way, when a person drowns, almost all the time, they do not verbalize. It's impossible to breathe in and to yell out at the same time. So that, uh, again, 
uh, safety for children at all times. Um, the kayak, if you see closely, those folks are wearing life jackets. But in many of these cases, uh, folks, and, and a lot of them have little experience with this, they, they take a life jacket, and they're usually required to have life jackets on the vessel, but they strap them to the hull. Especially in cold water, if that boat turns over, the question is, can these people not only get the life jacket, but get it on before the cold affects their uh, ability to use their fingers? So in, in, we're talking about uh, livery cases where people rent these things. And um, has, has the livery explained and have they provided proper instruction in using uh, these? The uh, federal safety requirements um, are basic to all states. Now, some of the states have additional carriage requirements, but this is what the federal government requires um, on boats. That claim proofing is actually what that is that um, on the carburetor of an engine, you must have a device that uh, prevents, in the case of a backfire, flames from coming out of the carburetor and igniting uh, gasoline vapors in the engine compartment. But that's pretty straightforward about the uh, PFDs. Lights. Um, lights uh, in motorboats Generally, you're going to have a red and a green. The red's going to be a left, the green's on the right. It should be invisible at at least a mile. You'll have a masthead or an all-around white light, which should be available at, uh, visible at two miles. And you may have a stern light, which also needs to be uh, visible for a mile on some of the larger recreational boats. Um, Non-powered boats, usually you have to carry a flashlight, what's called a flare-up light, so that you won't be run down after dark. Um, there are, you see as fire extinguishers, visual distress signals are required by both feds and the state. And there's some all other things that um, are required by uh, the federal, and that's sound producing devices, um, marine sanitation devices, and um, they have a requirement that uh, if you're um, that your boat have uh, both pollution uh, stickers on it about not dumping oil in the water. Of course, that doesn't have to do a lot to do with with uh, fatality. This information can be uh, made available. As you see, there's another um, Google or other, another internet address there. Now we'll get into some things about how boats work. And vis a car, most of you folks are used to uh, investigating and dealing with automobile cases. There are some significant differences with boats. Um, you're dealing with a surface that has an awful lot of less friction than with a car. So a boat's do different things. Um, a boat moves in three axes about its center of gravity or center of effort. And that's, uh, in most recreational boats, it's probably uh, on the center of the line of the boat, uh, slightly aft of the uh, operators and passengers forward uh, forward seats. The boat uh, uh, pitches and the bow goes up, the stern goes down and so forth, and uh, it, it turns uh, about that axis. Uh, and a boat, when it turns, it actually rotates. It doesn't turn the same way a car does. It rotates about that um, center axis. And also, as you can see in the picture of that Coast Guard patrol boat, boats heel when they turn, and they, they bank like airplanes. And when we investigate boating accidents, it's very important to keep that in mind, um, because it'll tell you uh, some things about um, what the striking boat was, in fact, doing. And then there's something about waves and wakes. You are responsible for any damage caused by the wakes of your, your vessel. As we notice from the Coast Guard statistics, uh, maintaining a proper lookout is, is a very, very in, important aspect. Um, and your awareness is primarily projected toward, toward the, the, uh, where the boat is going, but you should have some idea of what's happening around you. Um, and you should, uh, as an operator, you're responsible for, again, uh, the safety of the persons on board, so it's up to you to... Um, 
be attentive. Um, seating, um, it's, it's against the law, federal law, as well as uh, state law, to be seated on the side of a moving boat or on the back of the seat on a moving boat. And it's the op- operator's responsibility to make sure that, that people are properly seated um, when the boat is, is moving. Also, in that same area, um, the operator is responsible for telling people what might be coming. A number of cases, especially in open bow, bow rider type motorboats, where um, the folks uh, forward of the operator sitting in the, in the front of the boat are not aware of what's coming, and the operator doesn't warn them, and they strike a wave. And um, it, the fault generally falls on the operator because he didn't slow down, he didn't uh, he runs directly into the wave, he doesn't try to cross the wave in an angle. And one of the insidious things that causes many um, broken spines and, and similar damage in these cases is that the bow of the boat flips the person up when it hits the wave, and the person goes up in the air, starts coming back down, even though it happens very rapidly, and the bow is going back up again by the time the, com- the, 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 the passenger is coming down. So it, it doubles the impact on the, on the passenger's spine. Um, slow, no wake. Um, boats uh, can come at you from any direction, and there are next to no uh, speed limits on the water, except in um, areas that are specifically designated uh, as slow, no wake areas, and that's usually five miles an hour or less. Most boat motors, motorized craft, uh, the boats are set to run at the lowest speed at about five, four or five miles an hour. So uh, in swimming, around swimming areas, boat launching areas, and also in state regulations, a number of states say that you can only operate above no wake speed after you are 100 feet away from the shore or 100 feet away from uh, stationary objects, floating objects, such as uh, rafts, uh, diving uh, rafts, and so forth. So it's important to understand that um, what speed the boat was going relative to the shore and the, the objects. In most states, there is really no special regulation about um, speed uh, in conjunction with with passing another boat, either coming toward it or, or overhauling it. Although there are special federal rules about what has to be, federal and state rules about what has to be done while you um, either need to head on, uh, come in from the side of a boat, or overtake a boat. Okay, David, I had one question. Um, before we proceed, um, this question is, where are the Coast Guard specifications for the proper size of ropes for houseboats to use, and how do you know if those ropes are undersized for a boat? And lastly, how often should boat ropes be replaced? Okay. Um, I had a case uh, oh, three, three, four years ago with a large houseboat that uh, one of the lines parted and the person was injured. Um, there is no specific regulation um, uh, about uh, size of lines. Coast Guard doesn't have one. I doubt very much the states do. Um, what uh, the manufacturers do, probably the best way to get information, either go to the National Marine Manufacturing Association or the American Boat and Yacht Council. You can Google both of them. And um, they will speak toward... Uh, suggested circumference and test strengths for various types of lines. Now, lines uh, may be nylon and, and, or um, uh, different types of um, similar materials, but it also may have different breaking strengths. So I would recommend that a person has a case of that nature. That's where they go to try to get information. Okay, uh, and I have another question about jet ski explosions. This one is from Daryl, and he said that a jet ski exploded when being started. A three-seater quality interested in probable causes of this explosion where operator was badly injured. Could you speak to any of the explosions on jet skis? Again, um, a boat, uh, even a jet ski, is required to have a device that uh, prevents a, a flashback, in other words, if it's a backfire in a carburetor, um, from happening. And one of the first things I do to make sure if it's that, if, um, 
to check the engine to see if, in fact, that was there, if it had been tampered with, if it had been removed, in fact, if it was functioning. Another thing that may be uh, gas vapor, which may have something to do with the leak in the fuel system, which may or may not relate back to the manufacturer or someone who repaired the craft. But, of course, that's not supposed to happen, and you're not supposed to have explosions when you start boats. That's another thing, too. In most boats, there will be a standard warning uh, with a gasoline engine um, to uh, run a blower to rid the below deck spaces in the engine compartment of gasoline vapors. And that leads to something else, that there are numerous safety labels on boats. And, of course, these are all explained in the operator's manuals with the boats. And it's very important in a case to make sure that you both have the operator's manual and that the required labels were on the boat and understood by the person uh, who um, was using the boat. And that's mentioned in this slide. Here's the effects of some of the drugs, uh, uh, alcohol. Um, the very low dosages. We start with balance, and of course we're talking about most fatal accidents being people falling out of boats and boats that aren't moving. And one of the basic things is even at low dosages, balance is affected. Uh, vision's next. Um, a psychologist who studies this will tell you that roughly 87% of what we take in about the world, the information that we take in, comes through our eyes. And uh, if we've been drinking, that um, it's degraded. Uh, and this is an, at higher dosages of ethanol. And then, of course, the last thing to do is, is judgment. Especially at night, um, I'll, the, a paper will follow, and we'll take a little look at this, this paper that will show up next, and tell you about some of the effects that most of us are not aware of relative to ethanol at night. And we'll also talk about uh, computing speeds in boats. They're not like cars. They can come from anywhere. And um, they don't behave like cars on the water. I would recommend that the participants uh, um, get a copy of the, uh, the program and especially spend some time reading this paper. It was written, I wrote it, in 1993. And one of the first things you're going to see is that uh, legal intoxication at the time I wrote this paper was 0.1% BAC. Of course, now it's 0.08. But physiologically and behaviorally, the things that are enumerated in this paper, of course, still pertain. And I think if you look this closely, you're going to see a number of things that you probably were not aware of. Uh, one of them being that a person at roughly twice the legal intoxication level levels has a hard time discerning reds and greens. And, of course, they're not only the running lights on boats, but the red stoplight, the car in front of you. And if you were intoxicated, there's a good chance you won't know it. You may see something there, but you won't know what it is. This, hey, um, David. This, yes. David, um, yeah. before we move on to the next slide, I do have to interrupt and request all of the attendees who um, are looking for CLE credit to enter the passcode that we announced at the very beginning of this presentation. And we do this request based on requirements of the different states for um, whom we could su uh, submit a CLE registration. So I just wanted to interrupt you there. I do apologize. And so moving on to the next slide, I see that many, many of the attendees are actually entering the code as we go. So I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Thank you. And I apologize for the interruption. No problem. And again, I'd recommend um, obtaining the, uh, the videotape from this program so specifically so I can just read this, this two-page paper. The Coast Guard, um, as part of the requirements for the Federal, Federal Boating Safety Act, ran a number of studies about what happens to people operating boats. And one of the things that they found out is that in, in a normal day of boat operation where you're subject to... Uh, the, the noise from the engine, the wind going past the boat, uh, being out in the sun, vibration, and so forth. After four hours without uh, drinking alcohol, you still have um, a doubling of reaction time, similar 
what would happen with, with um, um, uh, drinking. And it's, it's labeled um, voter's hypnosis in a lot of the literature. And again, it's the primary affects your reaction time. So if you have a case where someone has not been drinking but has been involved long, uh, for a full afternoon of operating a boat without pause, this may be one of the reasons that an accident uh, occurs. And it's very important that people take breaks. Either go to the beach, stop the boat, put up the bimini, get out of the sun. But if you attempt to go, an adult attempts to operate a boat four hours straight, there may be some difficulties. Okay, I'm at the questions um, part here, and we've had some questions asked. We've only got 15 minutes left, so unless we get some questions, I might want to keep on going into the next part of the presentation. Okay, we do have one question. Let me grab it for you. Okay. Using a gas inborn engine in addition to using a blower prior to and during starting, should the blower remain on at all times? If not, why? Okay, what you want to do is to make sure that if there are any gasoline vapors in the engine compartment, gasoline is heavier than, uh, gasoline vapor is heavier than air, it settles to the bottom of the compartment. So what you want to do is to open that compartment as much as possible, turn on the blower, get as much air going through there as possible. You should also look at your operator's manual, and it'll tell you how long you should run the blower. Uh, most of them say five minutes. Um, and um, usually they also say that the blower is running at the time you turn the ignition switch on. But I would check, double-check the operator's manual. <clears throat> we briefly talked about personal flotation devices and the fact that small children, uh, both for federal and state laws, almost universally are required to wear them. The ages may differ. You should check whatever state you're in or also whatever case that you're dealing with. Um, statistics, again, point out that most people who die in boating accidents drown, and they drown because they can't swim. And what, there's um, reluctance to wear life jackets around large part of the population. But uh, to counter that, there are five different types of life jackets. And uh, type five is the um, um, type of, uh, that, that may be a full length coverall that protects you both from the coldness of the water, you still get wet, but you'll be uh, somewhat protected from hypothermia, um, to inflatables that you know, they are so light you hardly know you're wearing them. Um, so a reasonable and responsible boater should be aware of the different types of personal flotation devices available and, more importantly, should practice in, in using them. Um, they may not work exactly the way you think you're going to work. And on-the-job training while you're in a, a potential drowning situation is not the best idea. When you receive uh, a case and hopefully you'll be uh, getting a, a voting accident report either from operators or from the police, go through it and check it carefully. And then if you can get um, hospital intake reports, match them up. Um, sometimes there are, uh, for instance, if the operator is, is filling it out, it may be loath to indicate that he in fact was using alcohol or had made some other kind of, of an error. But you can as you know, with, in, in, in our business, these things are, are usually available from some documentation somewhere. But what you must be is assiduous in, in checking these things out. Um, statements by witnesses, especially diagrams, um, it is so important. Uh, boats are different from cars that are not on roadways. Um, they don't have streets, and the maps don't show where the boats are going to go. And uh, the boat may sink, and, of course, uh, uh, evidence may be on the bottom. You're never going to get it back. But if you can have um, witnesses use the same sort of pictures, charts, um, to, to mark where they were, what they saw, and so forth, uh, for an expert like myself to try to figure out what happened, it makes it a lot easier. And, and I, I'd always recommend putting that up front. Uh, 
and here's some just some very simple ideas about alcohol. Uh, of course, in our business and in, in the accident business, uh, personal injury, alcohol is always always present. But you may not know some of the things that were listed in that two-page paper that came uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, the PowerPoint slides before this one. Go back over that and see if there are, uh, when you read these accident reports, if you may be suspicious of, of something that you read in there that relates back to those papers. And this uh, rush to judgment idea, so frequently we think we understand about the effects of alcohol and drugs. Um, be slow to rush to judgment and consider all the evidence. Here are some pictures of boats involved in accidents. Um, the one on the left, um, supposedly it was struck in a T-bone accident with a, a boat coming from our, the viewer's um, position and running over the boat uh, from the side. That's not really true, and I'll try to explain to it how we could prove that it didn't happen that way. The next boat uh, in the middle, um, that's the port side of the struck boat, which was hit by the striking boat, the bow pushed in the side of the boat. The third picture over there shows two um, strike points on the boat. The first one to the left of that picture where the end of the rule is, is what's called the bow eye of the striking boat. All small boats have an eye on them, usually made out of uh, uh, chromium steel, that you pull a boat up on a trailer with, and that's called the bow eye. And if, in most instances, it's the first thing that strikes another boat. The other uh, indentation, the deeper indentation, is made by something called a bulldoze, which is on the bottom of the outdrive, either an outboard motor or the, um, uh, if it's an inboard outboard, the lower unit. And knowing what the relationship is between these two points is very important. So if you're taking pictures of an accident and you have a, a boat that's involved in an accident, Make sure that you take plenty of pictures of these indentations. Uh, this picture at the bottom, um, it's, it's an interesting picture. Here we've got uh, firefighters uh, arresting uh, themselves to save someone, but look at the number of personal flotation devices not present. So uh, even though people that should know sometimes don't. Federal rules of the road, best place to go. U.S. Coast Guard Navigation Center, and there's a, a number of drop-down categories, but the one that uh, you may be most interested in is uh, the one for the uh, Rules of the Road, 33 CFR, and there are 38 different uh, uh, Rules of the Road included there. Uh, again, this is the Navigation Center, Coast Guard Navigation Center. Now, this is very important to understand that the state rules have to abide with the federal rules. They're usually stated somewhat different, and they're, they're far from complete compared to the federal rules. But before a state can receive federal grants in aid, they must sign a document uh, that they give to the Coast Guard saying that their rules will conform with federal rules. So you can actually use federal rules as the primary way to understand state rules. And there's, um, you can Google a Commandant Coast Guard instruction on the uh, Internet, which um, requires that. And if uh, someone would like to contact me, by the way, you can get a hold of me through my uh, uh, website, which was at one of the first uh, slides, www.aquaticsafety.com, and you can contact me. And if any other further questions, I'd be glad to, uh, to attempt to answer them. Um, very important diagram here. It's The red is on the left side, port side, green is on the right side. What that green says is come ahead, just like in a traffic light. And what the red said, says is stop. So if vessels are approaching uh, in either one of those sections, not, not dead ahead, but to either side, and they see those lights, or even during daylight, uh, when you investigate a case, you should still have this in mind. The boat that is approaching toward the green sector is the giveaway boat. The boat that is, so the, the 
the boat in the center should be the proceeding, the, the stand-on boat. On the other hand, if there is a boat coming from the left side into that red sector, then, of course, that boat has the right of way, and the boat in the center must yield. There's also um, overtaking rules. Basically, the overtaking vessel has to stay out of the way of the vessel being overtaken. Also, the vessel being overtaken must maintain course and speed and cannot do uh, radical maneuvers. These are all contained, again, 33 CFR, go to the Coast Guard Nav Center, and these rules will all be enumerated there. In a meeting situation, of course, it's, it's uh, the, the task on uh, port to port or red to red, unless there's some, some extenuating circumstances. And also, the Coast Guard, uh, the rules of the road, Take that into account. It, it depends. The rules uh, are activated by circumstances and situations. And uh, when you read through these rules, uh, be cognizant of that. And again, that's going back over uh, what I've already touched upon. If you want to uh, have a better understanding of your state law, go to federal law. This is an embarrassing picture. Actually, I had a case where a gentleman was operating a boat at a high speed on a river behind my house, and he said that a tree came off the bank and attacked him. But, of course, he was uh, somewhat affected by ethanol at the time. Very important to try to get a basic understanding of which boat was the striking boat and where on the other vessel it struck. And then try to match as it says, maneuvers with rules of the road. And try to determine who, in fact, had the right of the way. Now, I mentioned earlier um, the uh, picture on the right side. You see the bow of the boat with a light on top of it, red and green light. But down below that is that eye. And in most of these cases, we have a collision between boats. That eye is the first thing that strikes the other boat. Now, uh, on the left side is the bulldoze that's on the bottom of the um, lower unit. Um, that's an outboard inboard um, there. And on the right side, lower right side, you see outboards. And they also have a bulldoze type arrangement there. Um, there's a difference between the two. The inboard outboard, that um, um, outboard section can be um, electromechanically tilted up and down. And in the upward motor boat, they're usually rigged to flip up if they hit an obstruction. But nonetheless, understand what the relationship is between the um, bow eye, that mooring eye on the upper picture, first striking the vessel, and then where that uh, pull nose strikes. There's another thing here, too. Um, with that white hull there, you see the boat's um, um, static in the water. But when a boat turns, it rotates, again, about its center of gravity. And when a boat banks, that uh, eye uh, in, in the, um, the upper right-hand picture gets closer to the water as the boat rotates toward the turning side. And um, I've had a number of cases where we have proved that the striking boat was, in fact, turning um, either right or wrongly, or I guess right, you said right or left, um, at the time of the impact, when the operator said no, it was going straight ahead. But because the distance of that um, eye above the normal water line um, of both boats would indicate that it was lower than it should be, which would mean that the boat was turning. David, I just want to ask a few questions before um, we run out of time. We have about a minute left. So we have a question from Kevin. And he's asking, is it incumbent upon the seller of a boat to restore safety labels, or is it buyer beware? Is the new owner responsible to replace these wording labels? There is uh, no requirement, specific requirement, that I know of that uh, uh, safety labels. Federal law does require that certain labels, such as um, oil contamination labels be placed on the boat, and it's the owner's responsibility to have them on board. But uh, 
No, I don't think that um, there has been any case law about that either. I could be wrong about that. Okay, and we have another question from Daryl. What measures are used to prevent fuel system leaks? What do you call the device that prevents carburetor backfires, and how long has it been required? It's a carburetor flame arrestor. It's been required for many, many, many years. It was one of the first federal requirements uh, placed on recreational boatings. Okay, I hope that answers those questions. Um, this is an analysis of both uh, strike points on vessels. And um, I mentioned that, that towing eye, how important I believe it is to understand uh, where a, where boats meet. This is a picture of uh, classic propeller uh, marks on the hull of a boat. And I mentioned that uh, there was an earlier picture where it was a T-bone type of accident, and the witnesses said, or the witness in the boat that was struck said the boat approached them from a 90 degree angle. Yet upon inspection of that boat, these marks were found, which meant that the striking boat actually did not hit it bow on, but rather, as the operator of the striking boat said, he, he slid into it sideways. Now, there's some, uh, and the propeller marked up the side of the boat. Now, uh, if you know what the pitch of the prop is, and what a pi the pitch is, that's the uh, what angle the propeller inter, um, uh, rotates in, in the water, you can actually get an idea of how fast the boat was going by how far apart these points are. But in um, inspecting a boat, always make a point of looking for that bow eye mark the bullnose on the lower unit, and also very closely check all parts of the top side, or actually, depending on the accident, the underside of the boat for these marks in series. And unfortunately, you can also see these marks on humans when, when they're hit by a propeller. And the, the classic sign that you're dealing with a propeller is that they are S-shaped, especially in, in, in flush. And we're back to question section again. Okay, could all the attendees please enter the passcode once again into the chat feature? And we do have some additional questions, but since we're running out of time, um, we were going to just email them over to you, David, if that would be okay with you. Certainly. And anybody, uh, uh, if you want to ask me any questions, don't, don't hesitate. Uh, contact me. I'm, I'm usually available. Uh, most of the time, uh, either my uh, email or uh, phone number. Okay, great. I just wanted to go over the CLE information once again. This webinar is eligible for CLE credits in California, Illinois, Minnesota, Missouri, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Texas. And to ensure that you receive your CLE credit, please complete the survey at the end of the presentation. In addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts, TASA also offers e-discovery and document management solutions, free interactive webinars, and research reports on expert witnesses, such as the Challenge History Report 2.0, the Professional Sanction Search, and the Expert Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending, and most especially David Smith for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Dr. Smith or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case that you are working on, please contact TASA at 1-800-523-2319. This is a reminder that we will be sending out a link to you with the archived recording of this webinar and the archive recording will also be posted in the Knowledge Center on TASA's website. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, please email Carol Kobolewski. Thank you so much for attending, and have a great day, everyone.